This week on Always On, I torture the Note 2. We unbox three new Motorola Razor phones. Sharon creates something called La Bobina. And I'm on the fastest boat in the world. What? Oh, no. Always On is on. Hey, I'm Molly Wood. Welcome to Always On, the show where we look at the tech that's part of your life and your future. Now, on last week's show, we unboxed the new Note 2, and then I got to use it for a week, and I loved it. The big screen makes typing so easy, and it's so fast, and Jelly Bean is great. But I couldn't get too attached, because this week, it went into the torture chamber. See what happens. All right, into the freezer with the Galaxy Note 2. Buddy. Two hours. See you soon. I hope it makes it. Let's see how our Note 2 is doing in here. Okay. Is that ready? Admire our crystal formation. Swipe to unlock. Oh, yeah. Tiny bit sluggish. But launches apps just fine. The touch screen's still pretty responsive despite the cold. I think we can call this a pretty easy pass. Looks like our note two is baked. Timer off. Let's get it out. Let's see how it's doing. We're not getting such the bad, oh no, there's some bad chemical smell. Yeah, there it is. It probably isn't that safe to be off gassing these kind of fumes into my house. So maybe next time we'll do this with the windows open. Okay, let's unwrap it, see how we're doing. Does not smell good. You know, I'm just gonna open the window now. I'm just gonna come to think of it. It's probably not such a bad idea. Okay, let's see if it's too hot to touch. Of course it is. Back up. Hot, hot the hotness, the hotness. It was the hotness, it still is. All right, let's see if we can get it to come on. The metal parts are particularly hot, of course. Ouch. Anything? It smells like burning plastic. All right, nothing so far. Definitely does not want to come on after its little stint in the oven. We will let it cool check on it in a little while. Our Note 2 is all cooled off, only slightly warm to the touch. Now let's see if it turns back on. What? Come on. You gotta come back on. Everything come back on. Uh -oh. Don't, die. Don't die on me! I wanna do like sneak PR. Come on! Come on! Okay, um, I guess we're gonna plug it in. And then see, we're gonna plug it in. We're gonna, maybe the battery died. I'm sure that's it. Be right back. Okay, I'm gonna plug it in. I just can't believe this is possible that the heat alone could have done it in. Look at that! It drained the battery. This thing went in on a full charge. Now apparently the full charge is back. Okay, let's see if we can get it to come on. I was pretty worried. Okay. Then of course the big test will be will it stay on after we unplug it, which I'm sure it's going to. I'm sure it's fine. Okay, waiting, waiting. All right. That's back on. It says charging. Okay, let's unplug it. Now we're back to full charge. We're back on the Wi-Fi. The screen is working. Connected to the Wi-Fi network. Okay. All right. Well, I feel like we basically gave it the emergency paddles and now we have tone. The phone is okay. Woo, the Note 2 gave me a little scare there. 
We have the second half of that torture test coming up a little later in the show. Before that, though, my fascination with sailing continues. Remember, I recently took a ride on the America's Cup catamaran of Team Korea. Well, even more recently, I got to go on a boat that was kind of closest to a magic carpet ride. You're looking at the fastest sailboat in the world. That's right, it's a French experimental boat called L'Hydropter. And this 70-foot trimaran with its marine-style wings practically flies on the water. I took a ride with its skipper, Alain Thébault, who first dreamed up the design as a young child. When I was back uh, at school, I was 10, I explained to my teacher, I want to stop my studies, I want to fly. Since you were 10, you started designing then? It's one life. Yeah. And the engine is passion. I have no watch, no calendar, no schedule, nothing. Just uh, the wind, my paper, my pen, my passion. The first time that yes. you built the boat, the première fois. Oui. Quel est différent maintenant? Oh What no, is different everything now? is different on the When I started, I started on a scale model, mm -hmm. a wooden scale model, and uh, the boat, uh, the stability was not good. And progressively, after I wanted to, to design another one, a one third scale model, I was living outside. I had no house. And during six months, I was outside with my carbon fiber, my aluminum, and I had the first help from aeronautic engineers. They say, What are you doing with your crazy uh, project? <laughs> It was a dream. Uh, I was uh, 18. Somehow you have gotten people to give you money to keep building flying boats. Yes, look, I started... How do I not have that job? I want that job. <laughs> His passion has taken him all over the world, chasing sailing's biggest speed records. Three years ago, we broke the absolute speed record over one nautical mile. Our top speed was around 56 knots, 105 kilometers. In case you didn't get that, he said 56 knots. That's almost 65 miles an hour. And it feels even faster when you're on the boat. The technology that makes this boat so fast mostly comes from airplanes. You have the wing design, right, Bernoulli principle, to get lift. OK, in the water, it's exactly the same. We use wings working in the water, and uh, we create over 12 knots, we create lift, the boat take off, yeah. and the hulls are out of the water, there is no drag, and uh, progressively the, the acceleration is really powerful because we have no drag. Over 100 kilometers, we have only two square meters in the water. Table is not a one-man band. He has a team of five others, including his co-skipper, Jacques Vincent. My co-skipper, Jaco was eight times around the world. Yeah. Yeah. He's the most experimented guy on board, but the, the, most, cru, the most crazy. Mm. <laughs> no, I can kiss you. <laughs> you no, I prefer <laughs> Molly. You, you don't think she looks very merci, different merci. since she sailed with us? She's yes, more... yes, she's a, another woman. Another woman. I am, I'm oh, changed. Yeah. I'm changed from my experience on Etante. Oh. <laughs> OK, on part là. Here we are. you have a one guy. Three on the deck, here in la terrasse. In la terrasse. And three inside, sleeping, or cooking, or living here. In l'hôtel. Yes, yes, come on, Moni. They are living here, come on. It is a l'hôtel. Yes, a l'hôtel. A l'hôtel. Come on, Molly. I will, I will show you. Look, come on, through the kitchen. Here is the kitchen. <laughs> And here is the kitchen. Here is the bathroom. And fork, nice, it's hydraulic maintenance, when you can enter here. What? I know, I'm living here, near the kitchen. So wait, there you're sleeping? The door. Yes. <laughs> here, yes, here is uh, our measurement system engineer, facing the computers, and me, I'm living here. Inside, there's a sweet spot to live. One is sleeping here, the boss, and two guys here. And we have only donc, uh, the bathroom, the kitchen, and the computer and measurement systems. Wait, I thought that was the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Everything yes. is the and, bathroom uh, in here. <laughs> <laughs> So now it's perfect? 
Never perfect. C'est parfait maintenant. Non, never perfect. Presque but parfait. Uh, but uh, I want you to fly, job done. Now I want to cross the, the, the Transpac, yeah. the Pacific between LA and Hawaii next spring. And after, I would like to cross the Atlantic in two days and a half with a new boat, a new design. Oh, really? I'm on the design at the moment, and the ultimate dream is to, to fly you know, around the planet. But we need to stay humble. Yeah, <laughs> one thing at a time. We need to stay humble. <laughs> That was just a fantastic experience. Alain is like Peter Pan of the sailing world. And it's not just America's cup sailors who are interested in the tech of eDrop Dare. He's also taken out Silicon Valley luminaries from Larry Page to Jack Dorsey. And apparently he's even going to get Tesla CEO Elon Musk on board. Maybe there's some sort of Tesla boatster in the works. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I have an army of razors to unbox. Time for our unboxing. Motorola has an all new line of razors. We have two of them right here. This is the Droid Razor M, the model that you can get here in the US. Inside this box, we have the Droid Razor I. Now, before we start, I just want to say I'm super excited because our grip, Dave, made me my very own box cutter with my name on it. All right, let's bust it out. Now, as I mentioned, this is the international version of this sort of low-priced razor line. It's meant to be a little bit more affordable. The specs are just okay, but there are some key differences between the I and the M. One key difference that is obvious right off the bat is that the Razer I actually has an Intel chip, unlike the M, which has an Atom chip. Here we go. Let's see what's in the box. Okay, we have our international power brick. Comes with the earbuds and charging cable. That's a short little charging cable. I'm not a fan of that with the iPhone 5, so now I'm totally hyper aware of the length of all the charging cables. It's amazing what you can get obsessed with in life. So let's look at the phone. It is a 4.3 inch display which after all the sort of megaphones we've been unboxing lately looks tiny. Let's see, it's, I think it's gonna come on though, even though we didn't charge it up. Let's compare these side by side. And while we wait for this guy to start up, let's do some specs. This is Motorola's first Android device that contains an Intel chip. It's a two gigahertz Medfield single core chip. And I gotta tell you, at first blush, you can tell it's just a single core. It has a 4.3 inch edge to edge Super AMOLED display. It runs, I am sorry to report, Android 4.0 ice cream sandwich. Jelly Bean is expected sometime later in the year. There's only eight gigs of internal storage, but there is a micro SD slot, so it's expandable to 32 gigs, not 64. There's also an eight megapixel camera, and the international version has a dedicated camera button. More importantly, and this is the reason that we wanted the Razer Eye, here's what the press release has to say about the toughness of this phone. Designed with premium protective materials, Razer Eye is built to go everywhere. A diamond cut aircraft grade aluminum four frame surrounds the display, which is made of Corning Gorilla Glass to deflect both scratches and scrapes. On the back, Razer Eye is made of DuPont Kevlar Strong 3. Spilled coffee? Caught in the rain? Don't worry. Razer is protected with a splash guard coating, even on the electrical boards inside. It's like this thing was custom designed for our torture chamber. Frankly, I consider all that a challenge. Now, as I mentioned, it's very similar to the Droid Razor M. We're not likely to see the I here in the US, so let's hear about what we're gonna get stateside. It has the same 4.3 inch screen with the edge to edge bezel and super AMOLED display, the same Kevlar backing. It weighs just 4.4 ounces and it has the same eight megapixel camera, a micro SD card slot for expanding the onboard memory, a front facing VGA camera. It is also running Android 4.0 ice cream sandwich even though Google owns Motorola. And here in the US, it does run 4G LTE on Verizon. But that is not all. Razors just keep coming today. This, we actually sent someone right down to the store because this was just released on the day that we're taping, is the new Razer Max HD. We're gonna find out if Lin Fu wants to keep it and unbox it for your viewing pleasure. 
All right, so this is an update to the original Droid Razor Max. The main difference is that it's a lot bigger. It goes from the now kind of dinky seeming 4.3 inches to a 4.7 inch display. And then you remember the deal with the Razor Max is that it's supposed to have all day battery life. Considering that this is a 4.7 inch display and it's running 4G LTE, if that's true, this phone's gonna be pretty popular. Except for the always legendary crappy Motorola cameras. Sorry guys. All right, let's see here. Pretty fancy box. Apparently square power bricks are just it now. There's it. Charging cable and that appears to be it. No headphones. Okay, well let's look, get to the actual phone. It's pretty thin, relatively speaking. It's got that kind of cool Kevlar looking backing. Let's fire it up. Definitely feels more premium than the Razer M, which it is. The Razer M is designed to be sort of a lower end phone. Let's power this on and let's go through the specs. It has this nice big 4.7 inch HD AMOLED display. It runs at 1280 by 720 resolution. It has a one and a half gigahertz dual core Snapdragon S4 processor, but a somewhat paltry one gigabyte of onboard RAM. It's available on Verizon on their 4G LTE network. There's 32 gigs of storage that's expandable through a micro SD card. There's an eight megapixel camera capable of shooting 1080p HD video. It does have an HDMI port so that you could show some of that video on your TV. It ships with, I am once again sorry to report, Android 4.0 ice cream sandwich even though Google owns Motorola. More importantly, it has the same 3300 milliamp battery as the original Max. So three perfectly serviceable droids. I have to say, if I were gonna pick one, I would probably go for the cheaper one. The Max HD is a really nice phone. It's obviously premium, beautiful screen, and I'm sure the battery life is great. But if I were looking for a droid running last year's operating system, I wouldn't wanna pay that much for it. I mean, I'm sorry. I know maybe some people don't care about having the latest and greatest OS, but I cannot in good conscience really recommend a phone that isn't running the latest version of the software for security reasons and usability. Jellybean is really good, Google. Give it to people. Ridiculous. Anyway, there you go. Three perfectly nice razors. Speaking of phone-related items, Sharon Vacton is back this week to debut her latest creation, she calls it La Bobina. I recently saw a project on Kickstarter called Un Bobin. It's a flexible phone stand for Android and iPhone. And here's the thing though. First of all, I'm worried that this stand will eventually damage your phone's charging port since it puts all that pressure on it. And second of all, it's 40 bucks. <laughs> So I put my engineering cap on and I came up with my own version that's less than $10. And I call it La Bobina. So without further ado, let's get started. Here's what you'll need. You'll need a gooseneck lamp. You can find one at a thrift store. You'll need a set of pliers. You'll need some contact cement, scissors, a suction cup, medium sized, and some sticky felt. Okay, the first thing we need to do is disassemble this lamp. So, turn it upside down, and on most lamps, you should be able to peel this part back and expose the wiring. So, now what we need to do is pinch these wire connectors, and all we're doing right now is opening them up so they can be removed. You should be able to slide them right off. And once you're done with that, untie the power cord and it should pull right out. And now we'll put the felt back on and work on the top. We need to remove the head, so obviously let's take out the bulb, we'll save that for something else. And here's what you need to do. There will usually be a nut holding the neck of the lamp and the head together. So with your pliers, hang on to that nut and clamp it with one hand and twist with the other. The head of the lamp should screw right off. Okay. As soon as it's unscrewed, you can just pull the head out and remove the nut. You want to keep that nut. We'll need it in a minute. Out comes the wiring, and attached to that is a nut and a washer. We don't need the washer. We'll keep the nut. And now we're ready to assemble La Bobina. So, 
take that nut and screw it on so that it's just flush with that part right there. So make sure your suction cup is clean, grab your contact cement or any heavy duty adhesive would work here. And what you'll need to do, the little muscle, is brush on a thin layer of this adhesive right here and a thin layer onto the suction cup. Okay, the way this stuff works is that you need to let it sit for about 15 minutes until it's glossy, and then after it's set for a bit, you put the two together and they'll instantly adhere. So I'll be back in about 15 minutes. All right, we're back, and it looks like these two are ready to get together. So all I'll do is take the suction cup and adhere it. And you shouldn't really have to hold it here. It should bond immediately if you waited long enough. Okay, they've bonded. And the last thing I wanna do to clean this up a bit is wrap some felt around the neck. So I got this sticker felt, it has a sticky side. So I'll just cut out a strip long enough to cover those parts. A little arts and craftsy here. All right, so I just remove the sticker and wrap it around right here. And now it looks pro. See? How good does that look? All right, our stand is ready to go, but now we have to put it to the test. So I'll grab a couple phones. I've got an iPhone and an S3, and I want to show you just how awesome this stand is. All right. Stick it on, it adheres perfectly to the suction cup. And check it out, it's not going anywhere. So I can put this next to my computer screen and have all of my screens aligned. You can use this thing for FaceTime, Skype, taking self-portraits. It really comes in handy. And for less than 10 bucks, it's definitely worth it. Now, if you want to kick it up a notch and make it more like the Unbo Bean that also charges your phone, you can find a gooseneck lamp that has a wide enough neck so that you can drop that USB cord down the neck and also charge your phone while it's on the stand. All right, I wanna see what you do with this DIY project, so tweet me your photos on Twitter and send your suggestions to alwaysown at cnet.com. I love Sharon's DIY tips the most, and I love that she gave this a special name, and I even have one for my desk, which makes me a little nervous, because if you've ever tried to suction cup anything to like a bathroom wall or something, you know, we'll see. All right, while I see how long this is gonna hold, let's check out the exciting conclusion of our Galaxy Note 2 torture test. All right, bud, you like that phone? Yeah. It's pretty nice, be careful with it, okay? Yeah. All right. Maybe go give it a kick. Just make sure it gets all the way down there. <laughs> You're being careful. You can pick it up and throw it, you can just toss it. Maybe try bowling. There! Now we're talking. Good job. It kind of broke. It broke. All right. <laughs> Let's put some stuff down and then check it out. Now, why did you tell me to do that? <laughs> You're not supposed to tell them that I told you to do that. Okay. That was realistic. But. Like most of these phones, as long as it can come open, it can protect itself. It looks like there may be, there's definitely a little scuffing on the screen. I can't tell if those are actual scratches or just scuffs. Here, hold on, let's do the pants test. Oh yeah, we've, we've actually got some legit scuff marks on the screen there, which is kind of surprising. Maybe not that surprising. Okay, let's put our cover back on. Got a little dirt, nothing too major though. A little scuffing on the side here. Okay, the back is back on. Let's try to turn it on. Oh yeah, no problem, didn't even restart. Okay, so 
It's all right with a pretty easy drop. Maybe we'll take it up a notch. Keep on going. Now here's something a lot of you suggested, the phone falling out of the car when you get out. And since I said that Celso, our camera guy, does this all the time, we're using his car. It's like a real life reenactment. All right, so say I have it in my lap here because I was using it for directions, getting all my things, getting out. I'm like, uh, oh no! Oh no! Ooh, I like how it tried to slide under the car too, very dramatic. Oh, um, we broke it. <laughs> okay, that's pathetic. I mean, I know it just went down the stairs, but dang. Between this and the scratches, it seems clear that this is not made of the same stuff as the Samsung Galaxy S3. Look, like, even the pen wants to come out. I guess our drop test is a failure. I'm still working through my shock and disappointment at this screen completely cracking on what seemed like such a small, innocent drop. But that said, it's not dead yet, so I think we're gonna have to keep trying to kill it. Now I know the water test is unfair at this point, but you never know, so let's give it a go. Let that marinade a little, oh, look at it bubbling. Just bubbling away. A witch's cauldron of broken phone. It's trying to shut itself down, and that seems like a good moment to rescue it. Okay, come on in, little guy. Don't worry, it's almost over. It's still on, so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and choose power off, as so many of you have urged me to do. Turn the phone off. All right, I'm gonna dry it out. I have to be kind of careful drying it because I don't want to get cut. Poor little thing. Gosh. Okay, so because it is not a unibody design, I'll take it all the way apart. Dry off the pieces. Get as much water out of here as I can. All right, and now today we have kind of an interesting little dry bag proposition. This company, Beastie, sent us their pre-made beastie, I don't know, pre-made dry bag removes water from personal electronics. So since we've gone through quite a lot of rice and silica gel packs, figured why not? Oh wait. Oh. That's annoying. Hold on. I'm assuming that I'm supposed to do not remove beads from clear pouch. Oh, that was close. Interesting, okay. <laughs> I guess if I used it wrong, it would've been kind of bummed. All right, let's get our phone in here. It barely fits. I think I'm gonna have to take the beads out and then put them in after. <laughs> Not meant for phablets. Maybe they'll come out with a new phablet size version. Let's get our battery in here. Up our beads down. Seal it up nice and tight. And we'll see if we still have a functioning, although fragmented, phone in a couple more days. Well, we know how the screen is doing. Let's see how the guts are doing. We did find out, by the way, that Beastie makes bigger size dry bags for iPads and other devices, so you don't always have to have such a tight squeeze. Okay. You gotta be careful. Ooh, look, the battery started to go back in. There we go. God, that damage is so upsetting. Let's get the back on. Ow! I'm okay. Let's see if it comes on. After submersion. Ooh! It does! I will be afraid to manipulate the screen in any way, lest I be injured. But at least it is functional, because screens can be replaced. That's actually not that big a deal, as long as it's still working. Uh, let's try to unlock it carefully. All right, pretty impressive. It comes back on, seems responsive. And it looks like, actually, it's even 
managed to get back on our studio Wi-Fi. Not bad. I will say that at least in terms of the water test, this is a pass. Now, speaking of water tests and the damage that they cause, I do have an update on the seemingly indestructible Samsung Galaxy S3. Since we put it in the washing machine, the GPS doesn't work anymore. It handled regular water fine, but maybe some gremlins will show up even in this one. That was a good suggestion, by the way, to keep on checking the radios in these phones after water tests. And I know you have more suggestions for me. Let's read your mail. Our first email is kind of speaking of dry bags. Mitchell wants to know, Molly, how much rice do you go through? I don't know. I mean, I like rice. It's a good carb that's not so loaded with gluten. It doesn't blow me. Oh, you mean like for the gadgets? About this much? Actually, this is why we try to use those silica gel packets whenever we can. And we're trying out that beastie bag because I don't want to be wasteful on this show. Other than the gadgets. Moving on, we have an email that says, I have an wild card suggestion for the kindly fire seven inch. One, drop it in a can of paint. Let's say someone painting their wall and knocks the Kindle off into the paint. I, the paint is sticky, so it would be a good stick test and it's colorful. So maybe you can throw it in your favorite color. So if it survives, you can use your favorite color, Kindle fire. Jack from Toronto, Canada. P.S. You probably already knew I'm in Canada because I spelt color, color. And I think you know where Toronto is in case you don't know. Have fun and think about my idea. Jack, that was some stream of consciousness email there. I think there are colors going around in your head. But I will think about your idea. I like the paint. I was painting recently and actually I did think, what if my phone fell off into the can of paint? Hmm. Hmm. All right, next up in the mailbag. Hi, Molly. Love the show. I'm a 10-year-old fifth grader, and I am not the only boy in my class who knows about your show. I'm one of five. I like the idea of actual flowing water in the torture tests. We have lots of it in Portland, Oregon, where I live. I assume you don't need a map. However, I don't think that it's a replacement for good old submersion. Now for the torture test idea. It's a Kindle fire, right? So how about roasting it over an open fire with logs and a rack for placing the Kindle face down so you can keep it on there longer before the plastic starts to melt? Or do we want the plastic to melt? And best of all, you can make s'mores Keep on torturing, Riley. P.S. My cat says hi. And he sent a picture of his cat. Cats. All right, Jeff, actually, in an upcoming torture test, Jeff Kanata put a rugged point-and-shoot camera into tinfoil and roasted it over some coals. I think you're really going to like that, and I think that idea has potential for future tests. Does anybody have a hot dog? You have a hot dog? Any hot dog? Next up, hi Molly, I just had to point out that during your test of the ThinkPad X1 Carbon, you may have inadvertently caused it to fail the water test by moving the machine. Lenovo designs their keyboards to actually drain liquid as long as they are left stationary, as movement can cause the liquid to leave the drainage system and enter other components. David, that seems clever. How would I know that? There needs to be like a sticker or something. Don't move this. I just did what everybody else would do. But that's a good tip. Next up, longtime listener, first time caller. It's getting colder. How about a how to session on how to make a pair of gloves be touch screen friendly with conductive thread? Does Sharon have any sewing skills? The world wants to know. Jeff, Sharon says she does, no surprise, have mad sewing skills. And she's actually done a how to on a similar topic in the past. I think we'll have her reprise that one because that is a very common question. All right, thank you everybody for all the awesome feedback. Please keep it coming. Always on at CNET.com is our email address. Send us some video mail or hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, or Google+. That's it for this week. Next week on Always On, we will have new Apple news. Jeff Kanata tortures a ruggedized Pentax camera, and we unbox the new Microsoft Surface tablet. See you next week. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I've got your back. Okay. 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 All right. Three, two. For Always On, this is Queen Shavak, and when it comes to tech, I've got your back.